Welcome to Oxford Impact Webinar. And um, we're gonna be talking about regeneration today and building community wealth using social finance as a tool. There's beautiful Oxford and, uh, and, and the sun is shining, no rain. So that's exciting when you come to Oxford, this is what you get to see. Next slide, please. We're gonna talk about several things today, the whole concept of regeneration. We talk about sustainable finance, we talk about sustainable investing. There's a moment in time, the World Economic Forum has, again, announced that the top 10 issues facing our planet that keep leaders awake at night are around climate change, biodiversity, economic and social unrest, tied again to climate, climate migration, and the systems of change. We're going to talk, spend time talking about how very different perspectives on regeneration um, the ability to actually use capital to inspire and to have a new way of thinking and acting. We're going to meet our faculty. We're often asked, a handful of our faculty, we're often asked what happens with our students, with our alums, and you're going to get to meet three of them today. Um, we're also going to talk about an action learning project, which is unique to social finance and impact investing, and that students get an opportunity to actually apply what they learn in the classroom. Then we're gonna talk a little bit about what's next, master classes in social finance coming up in Chicago, London, and Singapore. And then Steve Brewster, my colleague, is gonna talk about how you can sign up for social finance. Next slide, please. Again, this concept of rethinking what's important to us and how we blend economics and finance with environment um, to generate community wealth and wealth building through this new way of thinking and acting, how we regreen cities, how we bring uh, energy conservation to communities, and how we really, in both our social finance and impact investing program, begin investments with the community. And our colleagues today will talk about the very unique vantage points that they bring on regeneration and using social finance as a tool. Next slide, please. Social finance also deals with the plumbing. And when we think about how we spend our money, we've got investors with 100 plus trillion, advisors, market-facing intermediaries, community-facing intermediaries. And at the end of the day, the money needs to end up in community. How we ensure that flow of capital takes place public, private, philanthropic resources to ultimately impact communities. And that's what we're gonna examine in social finance. And when we think about the concept of regeneration, um, that's the target. End of the game, it's planet and people. Next slide, please. Again, social finance, unlike other uh, areas in our portfolio, we deal with philanthropy, impact investing, development finance, as well as ESG, that entire spectrum of capital, how we deploy it for lasting systems change. Next slide, please. And you need to click through this one. Perfect, next one, there's two more. That's it. So if we think about just the flow of capital, Gates Foundation and Coca-Cola, annual grants versus an ad budget for Coca-Cola, New York Public Schools versus Ford Foundation. That spectrum is really important. One day in New York Public Schools is the equivalent to Ford Foundation annual grants. So how we understand and use public capital, private capital, philanthropic capital to accelerate systems change is really what we're talking about. Next slide, please. Again, we use a systems approach, the interconnectedness and putting a person and planet at the center and building investments out. Essential concept, and that is what regeneration is about too. Next, next slide, please. And Darius, you're gonna have to click through this a little bit. This is just one example in India around um, organizations involved in climate change. Next slide, you gotta click through it, there's a few more. And we think about the system, those organizations and entities that pick up, that's, that's okay. 
you'll get a, join us in class and you'll get to understand this even more. Next slide, please. And again, those human security frame connected to the SDGs is really, really exciting and really important. But we see the system, not the silo. And that's what we bring to the table for social finance. Next slide, please. Next slide. It's gonna, it, we, we learn through cases and, um, and you can click through these. There'll be a number of cases that we use. This is actually Democracy Collaborative. There's one with UBS that talks about the development impact bonds, FM planes around ethics. But we use real cases based on research, current research, and, and we bring you into that research with the people on the ground, the people's lives you're trying to improve. Next slide, please. Yep. Yes, we've got plugs for books. Now, the most important thing for this webinar is to get have you get to know your faculty. And again, we've got remarkable colleagues taking very different perspectives. We've got advancing community wealth building and Democracy Collaborative. Stephanie McHenry is remarkable CEO of Democracy Collaborative, really focused on community wealth building strategies. Um, we've worked with her colleagues in, um, in Scotland uh, doing international work, as well as Stephanie's going to ground us in the work that she's done in building and working at banks, community banks. Um, Laura is uh, one of our alums, remarkable woman. Um, I smile because regeneration is her mantra and the work that she's done. Uh, I've watched her grow as a leader. It's an honor to have her join us. And again, the concepts around systems and regeneration are near and dear to her heart. She's gonna talk about what's happening in Mexico. Dear friend, Graham Singh is the CEO of Trinity Centers Foundation and the energy he brings into every conversation that he has, his smile represents that. The idea of reimagining faith real estate. Now, that's a $5 trillion opportunity for us to begin to tap in terms of regeneration, sustainability, and, and reimagining what the faiths bring to the table. Um, Dawson, again, um, is one of our alums, a fantastic person. The two of us are going to talk about um, an exercise we're going to do in the classroom, which is literally building a bank to serve tribal finance needs. And, and Dawson was in our impact investing course. Um, again, this idea of, of this very diverse group of people from banking, from an NGO working with faith, from a impact investor leading in Mexico and Stephanie's experience in Democracy Collaborative, very different perspectives. You'll see the system in our conversation. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Stephanie and then we'll go talk to Laura, Bram, and Dawson. And then we'll open up to questions. And we hope that you'll bring us as many as you can and, uh, and join us in social finance. Stephanie, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Gail. Um, if you could pop my slides up. I really appreciate the, the opportunity to be with this uh, esteemed group of colleagues, all of whom are trying to figure out how we best use this thing called capital to benefit our communities. Um, I will share with you that um, I first encountered um, the Democracy Collaborative back when Evergreen Laundry was just getting started. Um, at that time, I was president of Shore Bank, which is a community development financial institution. And we were located in Cleveland in an old abandoned uh, torpedo factory uh, that we had turned into a business incubator to try to pull jobs into the neighborhood. So they came by needing space. And so I was able to see up close and personal that whole endeavor get started, um, including the people that were getting hired and people that were getting banked for the first time. So I'm thrilled to these however many years, I won't say later, be uh, here at the helm at the Democracy Collaborative where we're doing this work uh, globally. So if you go to the next slide, we're gonna spend a little time on community wealth building. Um, the PFC study is, is awesome and has you know, lots of details. So I'm not going to drive too far into the weeds there, but I, I'll keep it high level, but I want to just hit on a couple things. 
first of all, we know that community wealth building or CWB, so I don't have to keep saying that long word uh, sentence. Um, yeah, the whole idea is to transform, transform local economies based on communities having direct ownership and control of their assets. And it sounds like a simple thing, but you know, sometimes when we look at challenged neighborhoods, you, you're like, what assets? There are no assets. We only see devastation, but likely that's because some of the, the capital has been pulled out of those neighborhoods. What we have to do now is focus on what assets there are that could be leveraged to better benefit that community directly. Um, we know that there are five pillars of community wealth, CWB, ranging from uh, procurement by anchor institutions, which I had an opportunity to also participate in as CFO of uh, the Cleveland State University, which is located right in the middle of Cleveland. And we did some things around procurement all the way to just use of land. And the one we wanna focus on here today is social finance as one, one of those important pillars. How finance operates is very important to um, the structure being able to, to, to work properly. So I think a very important sentence is in the middle of the slide. It says, don't start with capital, start with community. In other words, capital always just wants to maximize itself, right? It just wants to grow and grow and grow. That's by nature, that's what it is. And so that's what leads to a lot of extractive behavior. But if you start with community, start with what does this community need? How can we sustain this community? How can we have dollars flow um, you know, within the community that, that sustains it over a long period of time? I think you get to the right answer. Uh, so not, not only did we do uh, Cleveland, uh, we're, we've also been involved, as, as Gail mentioned, in Preston in the UK, where Matthew Brown, a very progressive elected official, uh, had the foresight to see community wealth building as an alternative to what I call smokestack chasing. Although now it's probably more tech, tech chasing, where you know people go out and try to get somebody to relocate and bring jobs into, into neighborhoods. Um, instead, CWB was applied, so through progressive procurement by those anchor institutions, they were able to create their own sort of economic power versus having to chase somebody else down. And then uh, we also work in Scotland, the UK, which you mentioned, uh, our colleague Neil McEnroy um, has been instrumental in having that entire country adapt CWB as its economic development strategy. So Neil is there on the ground uh, and he is helping, uh, helping the government there understand what they need to be put in pay place from a policy perspective. Um, and he's also helping to build a practice and build a culture around what that looks like. So, so that'll be a wonderful example of an entire country that is taking this on. Can't wait to see what, what Neil gets accomplished there. So moving to the next slide, um, back to this financial extraction idea. Um, we know that communities are harmed when capital is focused solely on profit generation. If that's the only focus, many times communities are harmed, especially when that profit generation is happening outside of the communities from which the capital is being extracted. That's pretty much the, uh, the way um, you know, the finance uh, world has started to work. And as I mentioned, I saw when I was president of Shore Bank here in Cleveland, um, it was interesting because all of a sudden, the biggest lenders in our neighborhoods weren't banks at all. You get the report and it'd be some finance company, this or that. It's like, what in the world is going on? Well, you know, we were kind of ground zero for predatory lending. Um, we had spent probably a decade working directly with families and, um, and community development corporations in about eight neighborhoods on the east side to improve housing, to increase ownership. And, and we had seen the neighborhoods improve, the housing stock improve. We had families living there. All of a sudden, we started to see boarded up houses and lots of foreclosures and figured out that these finance companies were literally going door to door putting flyers on porches saying, you can borrow $10,000 today, you know, by putting another mortgage on your house. Of course, they were failing to explain the predatory nature of those transactions. 
So when, when the borrowers started to fall behind, then of course the homes went into foreclosure. And the craziest piece is that they were bundling these, what I would call uh, bad loans, meaning uh, not responsible loans. Somehow those got turned into good securities. I'll never figure out how the logic behind that. But a market was created where these bundles, mortgages were able to be sold off, creating more cash for them to keep doing the same thing. A lot of the big banks got into that uh, and were greatly harmed as well. Well, we see what it did to the neighborhoods. So that's what it looked like then. What it looks like now, um, you know, after all the, you know, the, the various economic challenges we've had, you know, th there are a lot of foreclosures out there. And now private equity firms are buying up these houses, right? And, um, and again, with the idea to maximize profit uh, by raising rents and, and not really taking care of the properties, bundling them as securities. So, so again, we see it coming in now as, as, as a second wave. But what is the alternative? Let's go to the next page. There are alternatives uh, if your mind is on the community and you start there. Um, and I think the Port of Cincinnati is a great example. Uh, my colleague Marjorie Kelly who was telling me about this, you know, that we had a group of private equity folk that wanted to buy up a bunch of houses out of, out of foreclosure. Uh, but the port stepped in, the Port of Cincinnati, which is a you know public entity, they were able to raise bond funding because they have a great you know, bond rating. Uh, to be able to buy these houses instead. So they bought you know, a couple hundred houses um, and, and they were really bucking a trend. I mean, one in five Cincinnati homes, 20% were owned by institutional investors versus families or individuals. So this trend was not going to stop. So they, they bought the houses. They're now gonna keep the rents relatively low because they don't have profit as a primary objective. Um, and then we'll increase and stabilize neighborhoods by training some of the renters or residents to become homeowners. And we know that that, that accrues, that makes for more stable communities. And this doesn't have to be a one-off. I mean, there is a market for muni bonds. Uh, any port or any housing authority uh, can get into this game. So this is an example of what can happen when, you know, finance stays local and, uh, and is not being operated purely on a profit motive. Thank you, Stephanie. Just one minute before we need to go on to the next speaker, please. Great. Well, my last slide is coming up. So if you move to that, uh, just want to point out another couple key principles. You know, um, community wealth building is best when it works across systems and not just sort of little discrete projects on a neighborhood by neighborhood basis. We did that in Cleveland and that was a good start for Evergreen. The way we're seeing things now is, is more integrated across systems that have maximum impact. Um, many times we need to support that innovation. I know as, as the nation's first CDFI, many times Shore Bank was all by itself out there saying that you, know, you could make money by lending in certain neighborhoods. However, we at TDC helped form the healthcare anchor network that uh, put hospitals together that wanted to know how to do a better job of supporting their neighborhoods and reinvesting and then finally, often investment has to be combined with philanthropy. Not everything can be done on a for-profit basis. Things like networks or like this fund for employee ownership that we help get started uh, through Evergreen, which adds a whole capacity to the, to the um, ecosystem to be able to create more democratically owned organizations. So with that, I will stop. My contact information is there as well as uh, the website to get more information. Thanks so much. Really enjoy being with you guys. Thanks, Stephanie. That's fantastic. Graham, we're going to go to you. Um, uh, and Lara is en route. So we're going to go to you and your slides. Thanks, Gail. We'll hold on the slides, Darius, for a second. And just to say, Stephanie, we have our team retreat happening right here. And as you were speaking, I call, I was calling my team, just stand behind the camera and listen. And they were cheering in the back. Like, yeah, that is absolutely <laughs> right. So Thank my you. three is saying, yeah, so coming from Montreal uh, to you guys, uh, bonjour tout le monde uh, from the French speaking part of Canada. And I am from there, London School of Economics, uh, graduate degree in decolonization, and then was ordained as a priest in the Anglican church, okay? So when we talk about different backgrounds on this course, that's me. That's the diversity of how did we get this guy from the church? Are we seriously talking about that? 
Well, I've spent 20 years working at street level with the kind of organizations that Gail talked about on the far end of that spectrum, same one Stephanie's talking about. And it's out of that need that we began innovating. And we set up a new charity called the Trinity Centers Foundation, which is non-religious. And we financed now something like $75 million worth of projects uh, in Canada, trying to turn these faith properties, as Gail talked about, over to the local community. Here's my entry into a subject that some of you who come from more traditional finance backgrounds uh, may be interested in. And, and I, I didn't mean to, get, I don't think Gail meant for us to pick on private equity quite as much, but sorry, Stephanie, I'm just jump on to here. My joke, it starts as a joke, but it's funny, not funny. With my private equity friends, as I say, look, imagine your lifetime pro forma, every tower you ever build. Now what happens if I put 10 homeless guys in front of every one of those towers? How does that change your financial life? I'm not talking about nice homeless guys who play music and stuff. I'm talking about angry people who are upset and they're there the entire time. My argument here is that for purely animal spirits, capitalistic reasons, we need to solve these problems. And if that's the reason you wanna solve homelessness and food security, that, that's a start. If you come at it from the UN SDGs and other types of ethical reasons, that's much better. But this brings us, in our case, to the broader category, which Stephanie's already touched upon, of social purpose real estate. I would define that as being properties that come with a particular type of social purpose. They've been given often lands for that purpose as part of often a colonial settlement. They often benefit from a uh, municipal tax break. And there's a sense of a story of these are our properties, even if they may be held in trust by a private organization, like a specific, for instance, religious charity. Now, who owns this stuff? And how could this be part of social finance? Well, here's a pop quiz for you. Who is the largest non-state owner of property in the world? It's the Roman Catholic Church. If you add other churches and other faiths, religion as a whole is far bigger as a landowner than some smaller states. Yet we don't have a strategy. If we do ESG, the G, the governance of faith-based property is terrible. You might say the governance of faith organizations in general is very problematic, and I would agree with you. So this is the kind of issue we come into. And Darius, if I could, let me try to express the problem in 60 seconds. So first, wait for Darius to catch up. And I'll just, I'll go ahead as we're, um, so just think about these three questions. Property development, right? It's a beautiful force for good it can also disturb a delicate urban balance. So what is sustainable or even regenerative property development? Next slide, please. Now think about faith-based organizations. We know how much good they've done, incredible things with schools and hospitals. They are also experiencing a once in 500 year operating model revolution. What if in sharing their land profitably, they heal themselves? Again, with reference to what Stephanie said, in some cases, we've gone too far down the charitable side. We don't understand how these organizations might actually run their properties as a business. So next slide, please. Finally, charitable foundations. They have never been wealthier, yet they are struggling to scale impact first or program-related investments. We'll define this on the course in September. But in a sense, in short, these are investments that are in line with the charity's objectives. What if they could provide true north? for a new category of blended finance instruments. Thanks for the slides, Darius. So in September, we're gonna be talking about some of these things. We'll talk about examples of social purpose real estate funds in Quebec, where a bunch of foundations got together and they got, they, attract, they attracted a workers' pension fund who said, can you de-risk this for us to get it to investment grade? And they 5 x the fund. If we could see that happen, folks, every time, we would change the world. Foundations bringing on pension funds, everybody sings their way into a new future. It's incredible, right? In Canada, we have a new $755 million social finance fund. If every federal government created funds like that, and by the way, it's launching very, very soon. So we all just keep telling all the beautiful stories of what it's supposed to do to make sure that we hold the government to account. Uh, I'm going to be there at the launch uh, next week for that in Ottawa. So we're gonna be talking about that. What are some of the national government solutions to these social finance structures? We'll talk about faith-based organizations and those trillions and trillions. Is that all sitting in gold in the bottom of the Vatican? Uh, some of it is, 
how much is how much gold is there in the bottom of the Vatican will not be answered on this course, I'm afraid. Sorry, in case you thought that's where we we're going. And we'll talk to you about uh, a new social purpose real estate fund that we've launched. We've launched the first fund. We're about to launch the second one. We'll talk to you about some of the deal structure around that. Finally, what's the crazy version here? What could we do with regenerative finance at a local property level? Well, our view simply, and again, Stephanie queued this up. If the, those organizations who are serving the poorest of the poor could be given a series of leg ups, and in our case, we're talking about what if we give them discounted rent and we make sure that they're able to be located in the places where we actually need them. That's the kind of social finance solution that can radically heal the world. And finally, a word for those of you from non-traditional finance backgrounds. There's hope for you. Uh, there's hope for us, for our people. <laughs> and, you know, you will find kindred spirits and you will find that those who come from traditional finance backgrounds, they want to know what makes us tick. We need each other. And this course and this environment, and if I may say, this suite of impact courses uh, at Said is an incredible place for that to happen. So we look forward to seeing you in September. And I hope that's a bit of an idea of some of the stuff that uh, we'll be talking about. Back over you, Gail. Fantastic. Well, and again, we're going to be looking at that five trillion, how do you deploy that five trillion dollar that's available for investment from the faith communities across the world, as well as um, spirituality. Um, when we think about just the number of people that are involved in the faiths, we've done at Oxford an analysis, a landscape analysis that was driven in part by social finance colleagues. Um, the CEOs that we have a CEO's leadership circle for social finance. And uh, several of the CEOs have said from foundations, would you do an analysis of faith investing? Um, how much money is available? Is it being uh, tapped for, for SDGs? Um, how do we go about, in fact, um, mobilizing those resources in ways that we've not thought about? So we're going to be spending time. There's a report that we've done. We're moving on to another Phase two, which will be focused on energy conservation um, in Africa and new job creation, um, as well as Graham's work in Montreal. But there is a network in Islamic finance that we're tapping and, and again, spirituality of indigenous people. So how do we in fact bring and mobilize those uh, capital at a time in this decisive decade that we've got to move forward? We're going to shift Dawson. That that kind of enters the space for us. Graham, thank you so much. I appreciate that. Um, Dawson, we're going to talk Laura's and Roots. So we're going to talk a little bit about um, you, your work, our work together, and you coming to social finance um, and working on an action learning project. So I think it would be great for you to go through your slides and and then for us to talk about what it means for for our class experience. Yeah, thank you so much, Gail. Thank you for the opportunity to be here. And I've loved everything that I've heard so far from Stephanie and Graham. Uh, it's really exciting to hear about their work. Uh, and uh, I'm really excited about uh, this opportunity. I think, um, you know, when you go to places like Saeed and, and, and uh, I, have a, I have a graduate degree as well, you know, I think you, you learn a lot in the classroom, but I think for me, I always learn the most from other people right and their experiences and so um yeah i love the conversations that we've had today um my name is dawson her many horses i'm an enrolled member of the rosebud sioux tribe um uh, my tribe is one of 574 federally recognized tribes in the u.s um i have a background in, in commercial investment banking uh, i spent most of my career uh, much of my career, I should say, uh, focused on financing the casino industry. Um, and over the last five years, I've kind of transitioned and have um, been working a little more broadly on um, supporting tribal communities uh, from a tribal governmental and non-gaming perspective. Um, the, the financial institution that I work for, uh, we do quite a bit of work. Um, uh, with tribal communities, we have relationships with one out of three federally recognized tribes. We have about $3.4 billion in credit committed to tribal communities, uh, as well as about $4, 4 billion in, in deposits uh, with our tribal clients. And so we do a lot of work, but there's a lot more work to be done, right? And I think this the discussion 
uh, that I'll touch on today will kind of um, go into some of the reasons why I think we need to start exploring uh, social finance for tribal communities, uh, certainly within the U.S. and I'm sure I'm sure you know more broadly you know across the world. And so, um, if we go to want to go to the next slide, please, that that would be helpful. Um, you know, I love this conversation of, of regenerative finance, and and I loved um, you know Gail posted a video on Friday, Friday Saturday, um, you know, kind of talking about exploring themes of regeneration, right? And you know, really got me kind of thinking like, what does it mean to kind of put tribal communities at the center of a financial community or an economic system, right? Because I think right now this the system that we have, and and uh, you know, Stephanie and Graham have both talked about it, the system that we have doesn't work, right? And it doesn't kind of, you know, um, work for tribal communities. And I think when we think about U.S. communities, I think we need to think about three things. One, you know, we need to honor tribal sovereignty, right? And what does that mean, right? Uh, within the U.S., tribes are more than a racial group, right? We're more than an ethnic group. In the U.S., um, we're actually nations, right? And, and we're nations, uh, uh, we're, we're governments, and um, you know, I'm an enrolled member of my tribe. I'm a citizen of my tribe. I'm a, uh, I live in Las Vegas. I'm a resident of the state of Nevada, and I'm a citizen of the United States, right? And so, um, you know, when we think about you know centering tribes, you know, within a financial system, we need to kind of acknowledge and then honor that sovereignty that tribal governments have, right? Um, Along with that, I think we need to acknowledge, you know, just the legacies of colonialism in the U.S., right? And I think from an economic perspective, from a banking perspective, the big way that shows up is in land, right? Tribal communities, um, Native Americans and Alaska Natives, you know, live on, many live on reservations. And uh, uh, the tribal governments uh, that um, own this land or own this land are kind of you know, uh, occupy the land on, on reservations, don't actually own it, right? This land is held in trust by the U.S. government for the benefit of individuals, for the benefit of tribal communities, right? So there's no way for tribes or individual tribal members to kind of use that land as collateral, right? And what that does is it creates, you know, it just creates a lot of complications, right? So I think when we think about this world of social finance, finance a little more broadly, we need to kind of just acknowledge that, like, you know, one of the wicked problems in this space is just this legacy of these legal systems and, and uh, ownership and, and things like that, because it just creates a lot of complications that I think, you know, the financial community just hasn't been able to kind of wrap their hand around, head around. Um, I think finally, we, you know, when it comes to designing solutions for tribal communities, we need to think outside the box. Right, because in the finance community, we think we think in terms of a box, right? We have a risk box, right? And then we kind of finance things within that box. But I think if we want to actually support tribal communities and, and kind of put them at the center of everything that we do, we need to think creatively, right? We also need to, along with that, we need to bring in other forms of capital to kind of help open up um, you know, markets within tribal communities to be able to support all aspects of Native American finance. So uh, next slide, please. You know, there's a lot of work that's already been done in, in Native American and Alaska Native communities, indigenous communities more broadly. Uh, and I think the perspective I bring is, is somebody who's done a lot of financing with tribal governments and, and the, the businesses that tribal governments own. Um, and I think this is what, what I think is important about this perspective is that if we want to have an impact in tribal communities, if we want to, you know, be able to kind of measure and, and see, um, you know, progress, you know, within our generation, we need to think about uh, financing uh, and supporting tribal communities from a tribal governmental perspective, right? In mainstream America, the entrepreneur, right, is kind of a, uh, I'm in the U.S. Uh, in the mainstream of America, the the entrepreneur is like the center of kind of like our world, right? Those entrepreneurs, um, you know, start out with with companies that are supported by VCs and, and private capital, private equity, and they kind of grow, right? And they turn into these large corporations that employ a lot of people. But in in Native America, it's the tribal government that's the primary actor, 
right, on tribal lands in Native American communities. The tribal government is the primary economic actor. They're the ones that, you know, start businesses. Uh, they're the ones that, you know, typically employ uh, most people on tribal lands. And, um, you know, they're the ones whose kind of revenues are, are you know, um, supporting just tribal economies a little more broadly. So I think, you know, we need to think about if we want to have an impact in tribal communities, we need to kind of think about, um, you know, working through tribal governments to, to get, get the scale and, and make the impact that, that we want to have. And so uh, next slide, please. So tribal legal businesses was one way to do that. And, and um, you know, right now in the U.S., um, within tribal communities, you know, one of the biggest drivers of economic development is um, casinos, right? Casinos, and, and I won't go into it now because we don't have enough time, but casinos have been a big driver of economic development. Uh, the profits from casinos have flowed back to tribal governments and, and fund important governmental services. Um, but when it comes to actually financing these casinos and other non-gaming businesses from a pure banking perspective, you know, um, it can be a challenge because, you know, within a bank, you know, you don't, we don't always kind of know where to put them, right? Do we put them with the government group or do we put them with the casino group, right? And whatever group that we put them into, you know, we're not going to be able to kind of meet the needs of like the whole tribal government. Because if you put the, 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 the tribe with the casino and the casino group, the casino group doesn't know how to finance uh, schools, hospitals, healthcare, things like that. Um, so it, it's a big challenge, but I think banks are kind of working through it. Next slide, please. Um, the next piece of this is tribal governments, right? And tribal governments have huge finance needs, as you can see here, 33.7 33 billion in housing needs, right? Banks just haven't been able to kind of get there, right? Uh, some tribes, uh, some very uh, successful tribes have been able to kind of go to the capital markets to get the, the um, capital they need for um, their projects. But I think we need to, you know, start that conversation with the larger, you know, social enterprise, the hundred plus trillion that Gail was talking about earlier, that larger investor community and talk about mobilizing capital, impact capital and bringing it into Indian country or tribal communities within the U.S. Next slide, please. And then finally, like, this is like the big puzzle here. This is the conundrum. Like, how do we support individual tribal members, right? Um, because tribal members don't own the land that, uh, most don't own the land that they live on. They can't, you know, if they own a business, they don't have the ability to kind of pledge land as collateral for a small business loan. And so how do we kind of support them if they want a mortgage? right? If they want to kind of build a house, like how are we going to, you know, because a bank can't take that land as collateral, like it's very hard to get a, a mortgage, right? And there are some solutions within the U.S., but for mortgages, but it, but it's hard, right? And so I think, you know, when we think about supporting individual tribal members and the businesses they own, I think there's a huge opportunity for the social enterprise and, and, and traditional philanthropy to kind of come in and, and, and brainstorm and think about ways to kind of support individual tribal members in tribal communities because, you know, I don't think anyone's really figured that out, right? We have CDFIs, you know, Stephanie was talking about the CDFIs she worked up for. Uh, we have them in, in tribal communities, but, you know, again, we don't have them at scale and we need more of them, right? So it, it's a big issue. But um, again, this is something that we'll talk about uh, in social finance and, um, you know, look forward to any questions that, that folks have. So that's it for me now. Thank that's you. fantastic. I think that you know it's it's important that um, we're going to build a bank in social finance. That is our role: is to build a bank that's going to meet the needs of tribal nations in the U.S. and beyond. When we think about who owns the land or controls land worldwide, Indigenous people are the um, have maintained the nature, the natural balance. Um, and so how we preserve and conserve nature is really essential. So, but how we build a bank and to serve the specific needs of communities is something that is really important. You know, we've got Stephanie, who's been a banker. We've got Graham, who's got the faith on his side. We've got Dawson, who's got finance experience. And, and so how do we bring those skills to you in social finance? How do we begin to deploy philanthropy, public sector resources? Now I'm going to go back to my colleagues 
Stephanie and Dawson and say, define what CDFI is. Define what CDFI is, because that is not a phenomenon that exists in other parts of the world. Gotcha. So, Sorry about that. So, that what back is that suit? Community yeah. Development Financial Institutions. Right. Um, they were actually patterned after Shore Bank when Bill Clinton was in office in the U.S. Uh, he set up that function within the Department of Treasury, uh, where some funds were available to those types of institutions, as well as some technical assistance. Yep, and that's really important. And it, and it gets at one of the questions that we've got too. Um, Alara, we're going to get to you. You're at the airport. I, I, I see you're connected. But but the idea of what's the role of the public sector? That's one of the questions that we're getting in the in the chat box. What's the role of the public sector? Public sector created CDFIs. That was uh, that again. How do you create community financing that was government driven, public policy driven? So when we think about how we approach social finance, public policy is essential. How we in, engage and involve the private sector and the public sector is important. Now, what Dawson's pointing out is that's a very tricky situation when you've got a, a sovereign states and sovereign nations that are controlled by the federal government. And what is that dynamic and what does that really look like in that system of change? Um, so we're gonna hold that. I'm gonna go to Lara, who's now at the, again, it's wonderful to see you. And um, one of our alums who is, is also gonna be involved in an action learning project in Mexico, because we're not only gonna be building a bank, but we're gonna be building a impact investment slash social finance institution or organization in Mexico to help preserve and sustain fishing communities and oceans. So with Kobe, and Laura knows Kobe and Jorge well, yeah, and Maria Jose. So Laura, I wanna, you don't have slides for us, but I know that you're passionate about this issue, regeneration. So give us uh, five minutes on, on, on uh, Inspire Us. Tell us what you're doing and what your interpretation is of a regeneration. Yes, thank you. Can you hear me all right? Yes, okay, perfect. Thank you so much. And it's been wonderful to hear everyone's stories, um, starting with Stephanie's because I was a banker too at um, in 2008, but I was in Citibank in Mexico. And, you know, being a banker and being in wealth management and then going into asset management, it really put me in several dilemmas. So ethical dilemmas, um, accountability for um, to my customers to the and and just the fact that I had ethical dilemma for me was a huge problem, and I basically I got into a panic attack and um, their collateral effects after that uh, because I was ruining my identity. My in Laura, Laura, you're breaking up a little bit. Yes. Why don't you take off your uh, video and see if that's any better, eh? Okay. Yeah, see that. Is this we'll, better? Uh, Can you hear me better? Yeah. Let's let's uh, let's try that. Yep. Okay. I can also connect from from my cell phone. My cell phone is wonderful connection. Um. So it's as I was saying. Enough. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so basically, uh, I quit banking in 2014, precisely because I thought there was an alternative. And I heard about three of those banks that was a responsible bank. And I was like, if there's a responsible bank, what does that say about the rest? You know, if there's ethical investing, what does that say about investing? And I started questioning myself and I'm really, really happy that in this conversation, we already started with decolonization as, as one of the topics because that means the conversation has really evolved. I was in, uh, in Oxford in 2015 and I'm super, super happy to see the evolution of the conversations that Oxford has brought about and that I also have recommended some other students that have already been. And, and I do see that evolution happening, not only in Oxford, but globally, I think, for the whole sector. So when I met uh, John Collar, I don't know if you guys know him, but he's a 
He's a faculty member in, in Santa Barbara, and he does a lot of impact investing courses for the Ande management training in, in the US. And basically he gives, so what I said was that I had the American version of impact investing from him and the UK European version from, from Oxford. And it was very complimentary to have both perspectives, I think. Uh, so when I saw that impact investing existed, I really wanted to dedicate my full life to it, to serve. And basically I was asking everyone I knew in impact investing, like, how can I serve? And when I talked to them about my background, they said, you, you tell me if I break up. Um, they say that all impact investing needed a lot of investor relations. And that's where I started. And in Mexico, there was no Spanish speaking impact investing courses. So we started educating investors. And when we started doing that, we started realizing that many investors lacked direction when they heard about impact investing. And I thought myself, I kind of lacked a little bit of direction. But then I started learning about regeneration around 2017, more or less, uh, from John Fullerton. He's in the Capital Institute and he wrote Regenerative Capitalism that he now, call, he now calls it Regenerative Economy instead of Capitalism. And he grounds that concept in eight principles that he was inspired by nature to write about those eight principles. So a lot of what uh, all these previous panelists have talked about is grounded on two of those principles, which is a uh, circularity and right relationship. Uh, so like that reciprocal and, you know, relationship is found in nature and that distributive property is actually found in, in the best historical bank of humanity, which is the soil. So if, if we use the metaphor of soil as a bank, soil is inherently distributive by design. It nourishes everyone and everything. Um, so it's not even anthropocentric, it's life-centric as a bank. Uh, so if we use that metaphor of soil as a bank, then we can see capital as water. And we start hoping that water flows. And right now there's a lot of, um, how do you say when, when in, in Spanish is coagulo, when, when the blood clots and, and you have like, and then, you know, it starts going, you know, black, yeah, or brown, or yeah, blood clot, right? Yeah. So when when something dies, because there's a blood clot, right? So when we allow that circularity, I think right now there's a lot of wealth accumulation and concentration in very few hands, that it's it's acting as as a blood clot. So we need capital to flow. And basically that's, that's what I've been studying, applying, trying to do in, in Mexico to, to let capital flow, to ensure that it serves life instead of governing it. And I think um, a thematic that I heard a lot was about ownership. And I think ownership is, is a very important uh, concept that embodies a little bit of our current economy. But before that, we belong to, to the land instead of the land belonging to us. And it's, it's just uh, how do we shift those paradigms to follow nature's principles? And the work that we've been doing mostly since 2017 is going into the intersection with climate finance. So we go a lot into biodiversity regeneration. Um, and that's, I think that's my calling because my, my grandma used to be a biology teacher and she taught me, you know, to, to transmit that love for life um, while, while you teach or while you work. And I think I'm, I'm trying to carry her message. So I've been really, really happy to stay connected with Gail. I've been really happy to, to get to know Kobe, the, the case that we're going to be working on, which is amazing because it's led by really systemic people that are really at the service of the project and they're super humble about it and their mission is bigger than themselves. So I think that is very important. That is key for anything that we start in impact. And so thank you so much, Gail. It is an absolute honor to be invited and, and to be amongst, you know, Graham, Dawson, Stephanie, it's just amazing stories. And I think it's going to be a lot of fun. And, and I really want to learn about all of you too. So thank you. And it's just so, Laura, a, a privilege. 
I think I think for me the what the message for social finance when we're dealing with the most wicked challenging issues is the collegiality and friendship that we have. This is not going to happen by just uh, one of us working on a project. It's all of us, the collective. So what we're trying to do in these webinars is really show you what the community looks like. When you're in the classroom, this conversation happens. We talk about ethics, we talk about finance, we talk about the nuts and bolts of deal making, but we also talk about how we collaborate. So we do have a session on negotiation. How do we pull together people that, well, we, we talk about lost in translation and how we're multilingual when we're dealing with the challenges that we face and deploying capital with a heart. Uh, and those are the, the key, key things we need to keep in mind as we're the touchstones as we're building out new models. So Steve, we've got some Q&A. Do you wanna, do you wanna share those with us and we'll have the conversation, we can field them with our, with our, our friends? Yeah, sure. We've got a couple of uh, questions actually. So I'll start off with this one. Uh, it's got who it's addressed to in the, uh, in the question. So starting off with to Stephanie uh, from Barrington Jung Jungalo. Uh, he says, don't start with capital, start with community. Uh, can you please elaborate on that a little bit more for us, Stephanie? And then going on from that to Graham, uh, and I think to Dawson as well, he says, in Africa, we like supportive ecosystems for social enterprises. The question is, how can we build supportive ecosystems for social enterprises in Africa or anywhere else? So could we start with that one, please, Stephanie? Sure, thank you. And thank you for that question. Um, I think the idea, if, if you start with capital, then you're, you are restricted and required to first of all, consider the maximum return on that capital, right? So that moves you in a certain direction. When you start with community, then your first concern is how can these resources be better deployed and leveraged to make this community healthy? So you might make a choice, you'll make a different choice. For example, um, and, and this goes back, somebody mentioned PRIs, and that, that's a perfect example, because for many years, yeah, Graham, for many, many years, you know, charitable foundations put money in whatever they could put it in to get the best return, and then they spent, they, they deployed the returns as charity. So, so they were required with one half of their brain to put capital first, meaning how do I maximize the return? But then the other half is how do I deploy that in the community? When PRI's program related investments started, they realized that they really could put community first and invest in local things, get a return, and still have a return to deploy out as charity. So, so it's really it's it's really a lens uh, by which you decide how to use your capital. Yeah. And Stephanie, I want to add in the class, there's a an architectural metaphor that we use, which is form follows function. Function. Right. Form follows function. So the form is the function is what's the problem you're trying to solve? Who's impacted and how does capital flow to address that issue? It's not I want to return on investment. Therefore, I'm going to do something. It's what's the problem you're trying to solve and how do you build an investment around that? Whether it's and Dawson, we had this conversation. Do you want to build a bank or should we build a bank or is it a fund? So the strategies that we deploy in social finance can be things, whether it's real estate or private equity, or whether it's foundations or government funding, or a blending of all those. At the end of the day, you understand your impact by whose life or the planet or the issue that you're solving, you're trying to address. Not, did I make money first? And so we actually are spending a lot of time on the continent of Africa with our colleagues We'll be talking about specific investments. I do a, run a fellowship with um, Frank Iswani and Africa Venture Philanthropy Alliance, specifically on how do you grow social enterprises based on the problem that you're trying to solve and what's the capital need. So those are the pieces that I think are really essential, but form follows function, not I need to make a profit, then I'll structure the deal. And 
Program-related investments, we'll get into the weeds on this one, is a US, UK, Switzerland, quasi-Germany approach. The world doesn't have that for the most part, program-related investments, but it is structuring investments that have an impact by answering the question, what's the problem you're trying to solve? The communities that you seek to serve. And that's really important. Um, other questions, I, I, I diverted us, but I wanted to go into a little bit of more depth on that. Yeah, I think we're going to go to uh, Graham, if we can, to ask about how we build supportive ecosystems for social enterprises. Thanks, Steve. And I, I, I'm going to sideways answer one of the other questions quickly as well, because the role of government in here, to me, is the answer to how we're building that. And it's back to this question we're here on. Program-related investment doesn't cost government anything. It's only allowing charities to do what they're already meant to be doing anyways. It's an example of a light government intervention. And I want to say this. It's possible for some people listening to this conversation. I was making a couple of observations. One is they might think, this sounds very left-wing. <laughs> right? Actually, I would argue it's actually very right wing, because if government does the right thing, it will allow charities and social purpose organizations to do their job and lighten regulation and the government burden on here. Government can de-risk some of these things. That's the second observation. When you have problems with ownership, traditional finance gets very nervous. They think, hold on, I'm going to be letting you use some of my capital. What are the chances of my getting it back? And as soon as you start start talking to these ownership questions, you hold on, is it possible you don't even own the asset against which I'm secure? Yeah. The government can de-risk for that. And again, is a light way of government intervening. So to me, government re-shifting and allowing that, and I'm so taken by this, this metaphor that, that Laura put it forward of soil as a bank and getting those flows going again. If government can ensure that those flows happen, the, the most exciting news to me for governments is that the capital is already there. We don't actually need your money. We don't need much of your money. Uh, we just need to let it kind of flow. So to me, getting those things right, Steve, is the way to help those organizations. And the other quick, tiny question that was on there is, how do we do the community work? My one-line answer is, it's professional work. Doing community consultation is not the work of people that say, oh, I'm just going to go listen to the neighbors. There are professionals who do this, and we can work with them and really honor their work on the ground and bringing them into these financing structures. Thanks. Yeah, and I, I think there's one other piece, Graham, I want to add to the de-risking concept. So blended capital is what social finance is about. The World Economic Forum talks about the wicked problems and the businesses that are grappling with climate change and biodiversity conservation. This affects the supply chain of major corporations around the world. When we think about the World Bank and the, the uh, Asian Development Bank and the Inter-American Development Bank, that is de-risk capital. Those are part of our partners that we bring together to actually re-examine and rethink regeneration. So this isn't, um, this isn't a, uh, this is mainstream finance shifting into new economic models that are based on sustainability. OECD is actively involved. We'll be looking at a case study on OECD and how you have to shift from GDP to sustainable investing. It's not an either or, it's a both and. So it's, it's, it is, but at the end of the day, community-centric design and community-centric investment is what the World Bank does. IFC does. So it's not an either or, it's how do we deploy this incredible uh, amount and diverse capital? And what? how do you negotiate that given the unique circumstances? If you're preserving the Amazon, you're gonna be working with large scale government to do that as well as philanthropy. So it's though grappling with those issues. Laura, do you have anything you wanna to add to this? Yes, I'm, I just wanted to say that it's it's really important that we that we try to you know engage together the social and environmental impact that that we see them as indivisible because we are uh, eco dependent beings as well as interdependent beings and I just I just find that uh, very challenging sometimes. And, and I see that, that we need to, to address both at the same time. So as not to see climate change as 
one symptom, but rather see the whole causality that is uh, transforming the economic system. That's fantastic. So Steve, other questions? Uh, did we get uh, Barrington and Jim's? Uh, Jim, you had a question regarding Build Back Better implications for the tribes, tribal communities in the US. Doss, you wanna answer that question? What are the biggest benefits and risk of the infrastructure Build Back Better for tribal communities? Yeah, um, great question. Again, just love all the conversation. And, and you know, I think, um, you know, when, when it comes to Native American communities in the US, um, you know, I feel like a lot of tribal communities are economically invisible, right? Certainly we're, you know, we're invisible from just, uh, uh, you know, generally speaking, but, you know, I think we're, we're economically invisible, right? And so I think, um, you know, mainstream financial institutions, you know, um, aren't ready, uh, haven't been ready when um, federal stimulus support, you know, like um, infrastructure or, you know, there was a lot of stimulus support that went out during the pandemic um, through the CARES Act and um, things like that and American Rescue Plan Act. So there was a lot, there's been a lot of stimulus support that, have, that has flowed to tribal communities. But part of what I've seen is that like mainstream institutions just haven't been able to kind of accommodate um, some of the funding that um, and the projects that um, they were uh, intended to support like clinics, hospitals, right? Things like that. And so I think, you know, having, you know, financial support is great, but if we don't have financial institutions, if we don't have an ecosystem that's ready to help tribal communities when they get this, get these, this funding, like, you know, it's going to be a challenge, right? And I think that's kind of what we see right now. We have a lot of folks who are trying to, you know, tribal communities were, were disproportionately impacted by the, the COVID-19 pandemic, right? Um, because of lack of water, lack of, you know, clinics, healthcare facilities, but, and, and there's been a lot of, funds that came has come through but you know because tribal opportunities are are sometimes smaller right than kind of you know what a, a healthcare group might you know typically finance i think some tribal communities have had have had a trouble so i think it's it's a long long uh, winded answer but i think it's great to get support but we need a financial community that's able to kind of step up when when the support comes so I think that's fair. I think we're, Steve, we're over our, our time. I know that you're going to talk a little bit about people need to sign up for social finance. But um, Gary, we didn't get to some of your questions, the longer runway. Um, those innovations we will spend time on. And, um, and so join us. This is the beginning of the conversation. It's an illustration of conversation with colleagues and friends to try to address the most complex issues in the world. And uh, it's going to be fun. So, Steve. Yeah, I just want to, uh, Darius, could you get my couple of slides up, please? Uh, so I really just wanted to thank our panelists for today and just quickly run through uh, the social finance program, which is coming up. It runs once a year and it's in September. So there's still a chance to apply for this year. We have a, a group of 30 plus people registered, but we still have a few final places. So still, so please apply if you're thinking of joining. Uh, Really, we will cover what we've covered today, but in much more detail over five days. So we're looking at how to address large scale, wicked problems, systematic problems, as described by the SDGs by a blended finance approach. Uh, really looking at public, private, ESG, philanthropy, uh, and so on in building that. And we have cases from across a number of sectors. So yes, we'll talk about climate, but we'll also talk about education, healthcare, and so on as well. The next program is 11th to the 15th of September. Uh, this is part of a, a suite of programs which we offer at Oxford around the area of impact investing and using finance to try and address uh, problems. You can see all of those on our website, which is on the screen now at the bottom. So please have a look at that. Any questions, uh, shoot me an email. Uh, my email will be on the next slide i think or on the on the uh, on the website you can send me or my colleague uh, annabelle or Tanil a a uh, a question and we'd be very happy to get back to you and help you with your registration over the next over the next three or four weeks really to kind of fill out the group so with that really just to say thank you to all our panelists thank you for gail for convening this group for us 
Stephanie, Dawson, Graham, Laura, thank you very much for your, for your time and thoughts and contribution. And thank you everybody for joining us and your attention and your questions. Thank you. Hope to see you again soon. We'll see you in September. How about that? Thanks, guys. I appreciate it. It was wonderful to see you and um, safe journeys. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.